<clears throat> Good morning. My name is Krzysztof Maria Wilczyński and I'm honored to be able to speak today. I am assistant at the Department of Psychiatry and Psychotherapy of Developmental Age at the Medical, School of Medical University of Silesia in Katowice. Also, I'm working as a doctor in the Pediatric Center of John Paul II at Sosnowiec Klimontów. Uh, I am a certified ADOS II diagnostician and I'm currently doing my PEDD. Today, I would like to speak about the role of vasopressinergic and oxytocinergic systems in development and clinical presentation of social cognition deficits in course of autism spectrum disorder. We'll begin with a short introduction about the social cognition and autism spectrum disorder itself. Later, we'll move to the brief characterization of oxytocinergic and vasopressinergic systems. Here, I would like to present the brief summary of reviews I've conducted together with my colleagues on concentrations of oxytocin and vasopressin, single nucleotide polymorphisms in genes of receptors for oxytocin and vasopressin, as well as a single nucleotide polymorphism in a CD38 protein. And we'll finish with a brief summary of preliminary outcomes of the studies our department is currently conducting regarding aforementioned systems. And those outcomes will be put into the context with uh, current studies on uh, utilization of intranasal uh, oxytocin in treatment of social deficits in course of autism spectrum uh, disorder. But let's start with the basic question. What do we understand by the autism spectrum disorder? It is a group of neurodevelopmental disorders characterized in varying degrees by difficulties in social interaction, verbal and nonverbal communication, as well as repetitive behaviors. It was first introduced in scientific literature in 1943 by Leo Kanner in his article, Autistic Disturbances of Affective Contact. Leo Kanner described there a group of 11 children presenting with interalia, preoccupation with objects, monotonous repetitions, and insistence of sameness, but predominantly with deficits in social interaction. Although the first description was in 1943, the first diagnosis was settled in 1938 and first patient ever diagnosed, the patient zero of the autistic pandemic, uh, was Donald Gray Triplett. Year later in 1944, Hans Asperger, uh, independently from Leo Kanner, published his description of less severe cases of autism. In contrast to Kanner, Asperger published his papers in German and was not fond of making public lectures about it, uh, so his description did not make a career sim similar to Kanner's. In fact, he was rediscovered in 1981 by United Kingdom psychiatrist Lorna Wink, who was puzzled by strange presentation of some patients who seemed autistic, although did not present with impairment of language and intelligence. She was the first person who ever used the term Asperger's syndrome. In 1980, the term autism was first introduced in Diagnosing and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, but until 1987 uh, and DSM-3-TR, uh, it lacked formal diagnostic criteria. Since then, our understanding of autism evolved and slowly we are ready to abandon narrow terms like child autism and Asperger's syndrome. And in 2013 with DSM-5, we moved to the wider term, autism spectrum disorder. In my personal opinion, being on spectrum of ASD is the best way to describe the person with this condition. Uh, I'm sorry, okay. So, okay. We must remember that being on spe the spectrum itself, the ASD spectrum, uh, is not the scale describing the severity of symptoms, but rather representation of the fact that clinical picture of ASD may differ greatly from one patient to another. And therefore, if you've met one individual with ASD, you've just met one individual with ASD. And this, of course, leads to many difficulties in proper diagnosis of ASD. For example, 
Uh, we've conducted a preliminary study uh, together with my colleagues from the department and in cooperation with the Department of Molecular Biology and Genetics of Medical University of Silesia. We've included in it a group of 46 boys with average total outcome of ADOS2, 16 points, uh, 95. So it's a quite high outcome. What was of the interest is the fact that average age of final diagnosis was 10 years old. Record holder was 17 years old and was under the supervision of psychologists for nine years due to stereotypes, depression, lack of interpersonal relations, and troubles with nonverbal communication. Many of those patients are being diagnosed by, for example, uh, selective mutism or stereotypical disorder beginning in childhood. This diagnosis, those diagnoses in those patients were made after the change of the leading psychiatrist to one of our colleagues and ADOS2 examination. However, here we had again an interesting observation. Most patients with longer time of diagnosis, which was on average 3.4 years, got first diagnosis of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and it's proven that ADHD is influencing the course of ASD and the clinical presentation, making those patients less autistic and also less ADHD. So therefore, usually there's a problem with both diagnoses. As I've said, the diagnosis of ASD is not easy, even for a skilled physician and psychologist. And due to that, to that fact, we are currently getting better and better in a proper diagnosis. And therefore, the rates of ASD are growing in recent years. At the moment, the estimates of prevalence ranges from 0.2% to even 3% of population. The most reliable ones focus on the number around 0.66% for population of the United States and European Union. However, this rate is still lower than the real prevalence. Why? Because we're still underestimating the number of females with ASD. A few years ago, the most common rate of ASD boys to ASD girls was 10 to 1 and at the moment it is estimated to be 3 to 1 and maybe in a few years we'll see the, pre the prevalence rate of 1 to 1. The main difference between females and males lay in ability to mask social symptoms of ASD which as we can see in DSM-5 diagnostic criteria are crucial for the diagnosis. We still can't really understand the full measure in which girls differ from boys, although one of the possible explanations of this difference, in fact, lays in, in sexual dimorphism of function, for, for example, oxytocin and vasopressin. But now, to go further, what is social cognition? It is a set of abilities required to properly code and decode social cues and nonverbal language of which the most interesting, at least for me, uh, is the ability to interpret and represent emotions. The topic of emotions was present in scientific literature since always. The first analyses were present in works of Greek philosophers, such as Aristotle and Plato, but first systematic analysis of emotion with the division into different categories was uh, made by Stoics who recognized four crucial basic emotions. Two of them were good, two of them were bad. So good emotions were pleasure and desire. Pleasure was in the present because we felt pleasure because of something that was happening to us. And the desire was aimed towards the future because we desired a thing that was not in our position at the moment. Bad feelings were pain, which we can feel at present due to environmental influence and fear which, can, which we can feel towards future. Based on these emotions, they've in fact created the first system of kind of psychotherapy that aimed at apatheia, getting rid of emotions. Furthermore, the concept of apatheia was later integrated into early Christianity as a route to reach the agape, the perfect love of God. Uh, first, scientific systematic research on facial expressions was conducted in 1872 by Charles Darwin, who published his observations in a book entitled The Expression of Emotions in Men and Animals. He postulated that emotional expressions are common not only among humans, but also among animals. 
Furthermore, he declared that the ability to interpret emotional expressions is an inborn skill that develops very early in life and is present in children. Yeah, here we have a beautiful children with a facial expression. And since works of Charles Darwin, numerous authors undertook the topic of emotional expressivity. One of the scholars who is most prominent in this area is Paul Ekman, professor of psychology at Langley Porter Psychiatric Institute. His study, constant across uh, cultures in the face and emotion, uh, confirmed that facial expressions are in fact common among humans independently of ethnical and cultural background. What does it mean? It means that we are born with the set of emotions that we can interpret and express. And despite the cultural background, despite where we were born, among who were we born, we'll always develop those emotions if we are meant to. And furthermore, his analysis of facial expressions led to the development of the theory of six basic emotions and one of the most sophisticated systems of human facial emotion analysis, facial action coding system, FACS. He described specific movements of facial muscles that create six expressions, happiness, surprise, sadness, disgust, fear, and anger. Further studies, Bardu et al, uh, elaborated on Ekman's work and described additional and described additional uh, expressions created as a synthesis of two of the basic ones. Facial expressions are the most crucial method of expression of emotions and constitute basics of human nonverbal communication. They permit quick transfer of information about emotional reactions and feelings giving context to the verbal information and ensure it is properly understood. In 1998 paper by Andrus et al. Yeah, this is this one. Uh, authors presented that in typically developing human, ability to differentiate between facial expressions develop around the age of four months. Studied infants were able to differentiate and produce an adequate to reaction to anger, fear, sadness, happiness, and surprise. Furthermore, between eight and 10 months of life, infants seem to start using facial expressions as a method of purposeful social communication. And here, it, here we can see, yes, it was uh, 19, 20, 2010 cameras et al. A review that showed that infants are able to utilize facial expressivity in eight months of life. Typically, so-called pale effect or lack of proper facial expressivity is considered to be one of the crucial symptoms of autism spectrum disorder. However, data from the current literature remains inconclusive about that. In systematic review made by Harms et al., made by Harms et al. from 2010, the conclusion was that the, we can't con unequivocally confirm not only the nature of the facial expression deficit in ASD, but in fact, we can't even confirm that they are in fact part of the clinical presentation of ASD. Heterodegeneity of outcomes might be rooted in weak methodology of conducted studies, or even the heterogeneity of ASD as a nosological unit itself. Literature seemed to be more conclusive in case of decoding of facial expressions in children with ASD. In meta-analysis conducted by Uliarevich et al. in 2013, authors analyzed 48 papers that included 930 participants with confirmed diagnosis of ASD. Reviewed papers suggested that there is a significant deficit in ability to recognize emotional expressivity in children with ASD in comparison with neurotypical population. What was of the interest is that the research seemed to suggest that deficits are especially visible in case of negative emotions, such as sadness or fear. However, Ulyarevich sum up analyzed studies, stating that overall conclusion can't be unequivocal, as available papers are too heterogenic in case of outcomes and utilized methodology. But what is the source of those deficits and how are they connected to the pathophysiology of ASD itself? 
First of all, we must remember that Leo Kanner discovered autism spectrum disorder, which existed way before 1938 and first diagnosis of it. We can find traces of it in history and mythology. For example, one of the oldest accounts of what is supposed to be autism is from Herodot, who wrote a story of Lydian King Croesus and his son, who was mute. Uh, however, when he saw his father being killed, he suddenly spoke, disproving the deaf and mute fury. Furthermore, if we take a look at the rules of religious orders in the medieval times, for example, the Benedictine order, we can plainly see how fitted they were for ASD people. The day was strictly planned, repetitive. All cores were known and repetitive. You can even say that they were stereotypical. Benedictine rule forbid any form of communication despite situations of utmost urgency. Furthermore, no social contact was welcome in such order. But all of that are just hypotheses. As first formal description of case of boy who might be on autism spectrum was published in Anna Domini in 1800 with publication of story of Victor of Aveyron. Of course, we can list such hypotheses and sources endlessly. We can say that Plato was autistic, that Kant was autistic. In fact, many great people in history of Europe seem to be on a spectrum of ASD. However, the point is that autism is not something new, but rather a condition that was with humanity since centuries. People tried to explain it to themselves through some sort of possessions, gnomes stealing babies, and even now we have histories of vaccines that cause autism. But the truth is that the source of ASD is inside us, and most scholars at the moment agree on primarily genetic explanation of ASD. Why? How do we know that? The answer lays in studies conducted on pairs of monoovular twins. If one of them have ASD, we can check if the other one have it also and draw a conclusion that the rate of compatibility is more or less equal to the importance of genetic factor. In case of ASD, rate of compatibility in monovular twins equals 90 to 100 percent, which means that environmental influence on the development of ASD is more or less 0 to 10 percent. In biovular twins, which are also raised in the same environment, it equals 10 to 31 percent, and in non-twins, as, as small as 5%. So as we can see, the statistics clearly point toward genetic background, as in the most cases, this is the only difference between, for example, monovular and biovular trees. Through genome-wide uh, analysis, we have currently linked five, 651 genes to the diagnosis of ASD. But due to the high heterogeneity of ASD as a nosological unit, and possible multi-gene pathophysiology, we can't unequivocally uh, say which genes are responsible for which areas of clinical picture. In contrary to some laboratories, for example, in Poland, who state that for 750 euro, you can analyze 300 genes and confirm or reject the diagnosis of ASD. Of course, this is not true because we can't even say really which genes are in fact uh, taking part in pathophysiology of ASD. There is one exception to that. There is one form of autism spectrum disorder that was linked to the specific gene, and it's a Rett syndrome, which is caused by a known mutation of a MSCP2 gene. However, uh, we must remember that despite the fact that ASD is probably caused primarily by the genetic factors, its clinical picture can be heavily influenced by environment. The most studied factors that might exacerbate symptoms in patients with ASD are gastrointestinal problems resulting from deficits in intestinal microbiota or food intolerance. But with the latter, we must remember that I'm speaking about the confirmed food intolerance that leads to gastrointestinal symptoms, causing discomfort and frustration to the patient. In Poland, there are sometimes parents who tend to force their children to the diets, for example, that are lactose-free, without such confirmation. Of course, there will be no effect, because it's not the way that lactose is causing ASD. Lactose is here causing a discomfort, which exacerbates the ASD symptoms. Scholars that are working to uncover the genetic background of ASD pathophysiology lately focused on two neuropeptides, which have a wide and significant impact on human psychology, physiology, and functioning of central nervous system, 
oxytocin and vasopressin. Both of them are closely related cyclic nonapeptides that are highly evolutionary conservative and are present in virtually all vertebrates in mo and most of the invertebrates. Uh, the vasopressin and oxytocin family originate from an ancestral vasotocin peptide and evolve through gene duplication. Different variants of it uh, is present in mammals uh, and vary by single amino acids, uh, although usually they are able to cross bind each other's receptors. Vasopressin and oxytocin family is critical for multiple life sustaining functions in species ranging from nematodes to humans. In all species, they play a significant role in development of social behaviors, such as maternal care, bonding, trust, and recognition of sense, for example, in rats. In humans, oxytocin was proven to participate in development of trust, generosity, and recognition of facial expressions. Of course, we don't have a space here to fully elaborate on different functions of uh, oxytocin that it plays in social behaviors of different vertebrates and in humans. Uh, so I would like to recommend you a further reading about this uh, in Sue Carter's systematic review of the role that oxytocin plays in evolution of social behaviors in humans. What is significant for the further part of uh, my lecture is that in every species that were found to possess one or both of these monopeptides, they retained three crucial characteristics. First, is that they are being exerted in central nervous system. Second, is that they are crucial for social and reproductive behaviors. And finally, third, that their function is modulated by sex hormones, and therefore there is a visible sexual dimorphism in their function. The latter is especially interesting in context of differences we observe between males and females with autism spectrum disorder. Of course, if we take into account the possibility that those nonapeptides are responsible for a part of a social picture of uh, ASD. Of course, in these terms, we are speaking about the social deficits in ASD, which are also the main difference between females and males with ASD. But the question remains is if the oxytocin and vasopressin actually plays any role in pathophysiology of ASD. To answer that, together with my colleagues, we conducted three systematic reviews, of which two were published in 19, 2019, and one is currently being finished in press. Uh, the basic oxytocinergic and vasopressinergic systems consist of the protein CD38, which is responsible for release of non from cell, and this is the stage one. The stage two are the concentration of the neuropeptides themselves, and finally, the stage three are the receptors for both of them. In case of vasopressin receptor family, the most interesting one seem to be receptor AVPR1A. The first review obviously considered the concentrations of oxytocin and vasopressin in ASD population in comparison with the neurotypical population. The liter this literature review focused on publications in the last 10 years located via the Medline PubMed database, as well as the Google Scholar. Uh, we've included papers in Polish and English, published in recognized local and international magazines, which were original papers. Uh, the review was performed by each author independently, and it was divided into three stages. In the first one, in the first one, uh, the we in the first stage of the review covered the search for publications as well as the analysis of their compatibility with the subject of the review on the basis of the title of the paper. Initially, we've identified 487 papers, and out of we, out of which we've selected from 233 to 245, depending on author, papers that were accepted for the further analysis. During the second stage, the abstract was analyzed in terms of the inclusion criteria, and 199 to 204 papers were excluded. Remaining papers were compared, and once duplicates were eliminated, their number equaled 29, and they went, underwent a preliminary full text analysis aimed at the evaluation of their compatibility with the assumed inclusion criteria. Furthermore, the analysis of bibliography of the included papers were carried out and Finally, 12 papers were included in the review, and they revealed a significant heterogeneity 
of the results, making it impossible to draw unequivocal conclusions. Most of the authors seemed to agree on the existence of significant difference between neuropeptides concentrations between patients with ASD and neurotypical ones. However, predominantly criteria and therefore at risk of being subjective diagnosis is most of the paper is, is present in most of the papers, as well as in inter alia lack of division between females and males heavily influenced the credibility of analyzed paper. What one should keep in mind is the arguments for the existence of such a difference, which come from, among others, neuroimaging. In the study by Kerf et al. of 2011, Uh, on the group of 104 children, 52 with confirmed autism spectrum disorder and 52 controls, by means of magnetic resonance imaging, a significant reduction of the gray matter volume of the hypothalamus in the region of paraventricular and supraoptic nuclei was observed in the ASD children. According to the authors, this type of lesion may result from atrophy of neurons located in this nuclei, which are res responsible for vasopressin and oxytocin secretion. Further, uh, further results were also presented in a study of Shaw et al. of 2017. It reached significant uh, changes in the volume and the number of connections between the structures with vasopressinergic neurons were observed in the group of children with ASD. On the other hand, studies on the nosological entities revealed data that suggest the participation of these neuropeptides in such disorders are ADHD or obsessive compulsive disorder which are often accompanying the ASD. Thus, this can also be an argument for the participation of those neuropeptides in the development of ASD. The second review considered single nucleotide polymorphisms in genes for oxytocin and vasopressin receptor. In fact, it was supposed to analyze also the expression of these genes through papers assessing the concentrations of RNA, for each of them. However, at the moment of conducting this review, we did not find any relevant research on that. This review was also focused on papers published in between 2008 and 2018, located near the same databases and based on the same similar criteria as the previous review. The initial screening here identified 2,456 publications, from which 491 uh, were included for further analysis. During the preliminary analysis of abstract, 357 papers were excluded due to loose relation to the analyzed subject or because they were not full text publications. Finally, after the full text analysis, 11 publications remained noteworthy uh, and were further analyzed. The most important links between single nucleotide polymorphism in oxytocin receptor and social cognition in course of ASD were found for two first columns here. So as you can see, it's RS2254298 and RS53576. Those were two most studied uh, single nucleotide polymorphism in OXTR. However, as you can see, there were plenty others which were studied less. Uh, unfortunately, there was almost no studies that included more than five or six of the polymorphisms. And similar situation was also in the vasopressin receptor game. However, as you can see, there is lack of many studies. In fact, there were like three to four, five. There were five studies about that, in fact, in the literature. So it was not that popular uh, topic. Uh, obtained results, however, in the, this whole review did not allow us to draw an unequivocal conclusions from, from them, yeah? So we couldn't say that there is or there is no connection. Uh, it's because, usually it was because inconsistent methodology, often with lack of reliable uh, inclusion mechanism, for example, through IDOS to testing. Uh, usually it was just a criterial diagnosis. Third review that is currently under the preparation and hopefully will be published in the beginning of 2022 is a systematic review of single nucleotide polymorphism in CD38 gene. However, data we've obtained so far, unsurprisingly, is not only scarce, but also unequivocal. So here I would like to go back to the pre preliminary outcomes of the project we are currently running at our Department of Psychiatry and Psychotherapy of Developmental Aging Systems. 
Based on data acquired through our reviews, uh, we've prepared a project aiming at verifying ambiguities present in literature. First of all, we are aiming at including as many significant polymorphisms in receptors and CD38 genes as possible to get the most comprehensive picture. Furthermore, we've decided to divide study and control groups analyzing girls and boys separately to avoid uh, bias coming from the sexual dimorphism. Uh, all patients included in the study had diagnosis verified by ADOS2 and clinical evaluation. As I have said before, uh, preliminary results are drew from the group of 42 boys with confirmed diagnosis of ASD through ADOS2 testing, as well as clinical evaluation and interview with parents. For now, we've analyzed four SNPs, two in oxytocin receptor gene and two in vasopressin receptor gene. In fact, those were the most popularly uh, analyzed uh, SNPs in the lit literature thus far. Currently, we are, of course, extending both our research groups. And at the moment, we have around 100 patients and the range of studied polymorphism, which is right now equaling more or less eight to nine in oxytocin receptor gene two in vasopressin gene and also two in CD38 gene. Simultaneously, we are evaluating concentrations of RNA for each of these genes, what will allow us to analyze the levels of expression of each of them, and then verify the, which polymorphism is in fact causing the, uh, for example, lowered expression of that receptor. In case of our group, as we can see on the present slide, uh, there was an overwhelming overrepresentation of the mutant allele. It's not that slide. Yeah, this one. Uh, overwhelming rep overrepresentation of the mutant allele, especially visible in case of SNPRS2254298, where we found that the mutated allele was present in 100% of cases, and in 88% it was homozygotic. In the same time, expected frequency of the mutated allele based on the world healthy population, neurotypical population, was between 7 to 33%. So it's three times higher. In case of RS53576, also in oxytocin receptor gene, we can similarly see that the frequency of the mutant allele equaled 85% of population, while expected frequency was around 30%. What does it mean? It means that this overrepresentation, of course, we must remember that those outcomes seem promising, but we must remember that this is a preliminary data, and only after gathering more cases we can draw more reliable conclusions. But if this is true, then this is a proof that maybe we can diagnose uh, at least some sort of autism spectrum disorder, some specific type of it, through the oxytocin receptor genes, through the polymorphisms in them. And then we can use this group, the selected group, to maybe uh, check if the treatment with the intranasal oxytocin will work in it. Logic behind this type of treatment is simple. If social deficits, not exclusively in autism, is linked to the deficit in oxytocin and vasopressin, then supplementing it should improve symptoms. But yet data from the literature is inconsistent both in the clinical and in healthy populations. In meta-analysis from 2017 by Leppanen and al, only one study was concerning the ASD population and the outcomes seemed promising. Although we need to take into account that method used to verify the improvement was not very reliable, as authors used salient and test. Furthermore, in 2020, mm -hmm. uh, in 2020, Yamasu et al. published an original article analyzing utilization of intranasal oxytocin for social deficit in ASD. The study was conducted on the group of 106 ASD individuals and based on findings, authors did not observe significantly higher improvement. So basically, they found that oxytocin was as good as placebo. However, in 2013, study by Downs uh, et al. Uh, found that patients with ASD on oxytocin presented increased activity in right amygdala compared to the placebo group, what suggests that oxytocin increases the saliency of social stimuli and promote face processing and eye contact in individuals with ASD. So it is of the interest what is an exact cause of this heterogeneity in outcomes available in literature? Leading theory will point towards low interstudy homogenization of methodology, not equal participation of males and females, and of course, heterogeneity of ASD itself. Therefore, studying polymorphisms in genes connected to the oxytocin and vasopressin pathways 
might in fact allow us to understand that heterogeneity better and in the future make it evident that we can distinguish subgroups of patients with ISD who will be susceptible to the oxytocin treatment and then will be able not only to help those patients even more, but first of all, will be able to diagnose them better. Thank you very much for your attention. Шановні колеги, ми закінчили програму першого дня нашої школи аутизму. Дякую всіх, хто залишався з нами і в залі, і на онлайн-зв'язку. Нагадую, завтра ми починаємо працювати о 10-й годині ранку. Також дуже напружена програма. І, як завжди, вона закінчується пленарними лекціями. Тому доброго відпочинку, до завтра, до зустрічі в цьому залі і на онлайн, на просторах онлайн-зв'язку. До зустрічі.